What started as a no-nonsense way to jam-pack as much gardening information into two minutes as possible has certainly evolved. I never could have imagined the response to this format being so positive. Each and every week with every video, the wide array of topics we've covered so far, the feedback and engagement has been amazing. 40 videos in and I'm already looking forward to the next 40. For those of you that may have missed a show or two along the way, here's episodes 31 to 40. Regardless of the season, there's always going to be excess plant material. Either from spent crops, or from the annual pruning. Even nature deals with this. It does so during its annual deciduous leaf drop, sending valuable nutrients and organic matter back to earth and creating a protective layer for that valuable topsoil. In the garden, we can do the exact same thing and it's called chop and drop. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we try to answer the most pertinent gardening questions of the day. And today is all about chop and drop. Okay, so just what is chop and drop? Well, it's exactly as it sounds. After a crop is over, instead of pulling it out of the ground or chopping it down and dragging the excess leaves and stems to the compost, we chop it right at the root collar and leave it in place. Think of it as a free instantaneous mulch that has mega benefits for your garden. Five in fact. Time short, so let's run down the list. The first benefit is that the dropped material returns back to the soil a near identical nutrient profile as to what was taken out by the plants. Second, by leaving this plant material in place, we're protecting the topsoil from the harshness of the elements, just like any mulch would. Third, by leaving the ground covered, just like it would be in nature, water loss by evaporation is completely mitigated. And excess water from fall winter precipitation is prevented from eroding the delicate topsoil. Four, just by dropping the material right in place, you're saving yourself the time and energy of not having to haul it off to the compost. And finally, the chop and drop method is the ultimate support for soil life. Minimal disturbance by leaving the root systems in place and maximum protection by covering the bioactive top layers. That alone is reason enough. Chop and drop is a fantastically free way to ensure better yields year over year. Know what else is fantastic and free? Probably the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Cilantro, the lush green herb that's the epitome of fresh. And while it's most often associated with dishes from tropical climates, the plant itself can be grown in quite cool conditions. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we solve the gardening questions that nobody asks. And today is all about cilantro's cold tolerance. To germinate cilantro with any degree of success, it should be quite warm. Around 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius for best results. It pops up fast within a week, but the tiny seedlings are pretty fragile. A week later, the true leaves start to appear and we're in business. After about six weeks, we have mostly adult plants and we're ready to experiment. The temperature outside has just hit 17 degrees Fahrenheit or negative eight degrees Celsius. So I don't think we can go that low, not yet anyways. For now, the unheated garage sitting at a crisp 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius is gonna have to do. So far, so good. No damage to the leaves, plants still growing just fine. Do note that despite the cooler conditions, I'm still providing eight hours of full spectrum light every day. Outdoors, the weather is warm to about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, five degrees Celsius, so I bring the cilantro out. 
A couple of days of this, with evening drops even close to freezing and still no signs of damage. For a tropical plant, this all seems impossible, but keep watching. The next day, the storm of all storm hits about a foot of snow overnight. Unreal. That's it. The cilantro is definitely done for, right? Well, hang on. About a week goes by, the weather warms up, and the snow recedes. And in that melting snow, we see green. Sure, the plants are a little beaten up, but they just survived a foot of snow and sub-zero temperatures. That's pretty unreal. I fully meant to bring the plants inside, but as it does on the West Coast, winter hits again. And you won't believe it, another foot of snow in 24 hours. Just how much can one tropical plant take? Well, let's dig some of these guys out and find out. Miraculously, still green, still growing. I considered cilantro a wonder herb before. Now I need to rethink everything I thought I knew about it. You know what you don't have to rethink though? Watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. <sighs> Plants are grouped and categorized in many different ways. And our backyard crops like this rosemary are no different. Root crops and fruit crops, leaf crops and green crops. What we grow them for and how we do it are all ways to group our favorite edible plants. One common but more scientific way to classify them is based on their life cycle. Surely you've heard of annuals such as this cilantro here and perennials like this dormant blueberry bush. But there's a third type of life cycle that many aren't aware of. Hi. I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we talk about some pretty interesting gardening facts. And today is all about biennial plants. So what is a biennial? Quite simply, biennials are flowering plants that have a two-year life cycle. While an annual plant lives, grows, produces, and dies within a year, and a perennial lives out their life cycle over the course of three years or more, biennials are right in the middle. As seeds, they germinate, grow, produce roots, stems, and leaves, all in the first year. Winter then either causes the plants to slow down or go completely dormant. And then in the second year, the plants will flower, completing their life cycle. As growers, you may not know this, but we actually have quite a few biennial plants in our backyard gardens. Favorites such as beets, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, carrots, celery, collards, kale, lettuce, onions, and Swiss chard. Of course, modern plant breeding and your local climate may stretch some of these guys to becoming perennials, or it may even shorten some of their life cycles to becoming an annual. Either way, they're still in fact classified as biennials. Fun stuff. Know what else is fun? Probably the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Every year winter does what it does and shuts down much of my garden. Sure, some plants squeak by unfazed by the snow and bitter cold, but for the most part, it's dark dreary days. And it's this prolonged dormancy that has growers yearning for the coming spring. However, not only is the winter break a good thing, for some plants, such as this blueberry, it's a necessity. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we cover the hot gardening topics of the day. Or in this case, the cool ones, because today is all about vernalization. So just what is vernalization? 
Well, the textbook definition of vernalization is the induction of a plant's flowering process by exposure to prolonged cold. So, in a nutshell, it's the seasonal trigger that allows the flowering and bud formation in perennial and biennial plants. But why is that important to us growers? Well, think about it. As temperate gardeners, every fruit we grow is the direct result of this flowering bud formation over winter. And in our modern times, there's a ton of things that mess with this process. Things such as different plant varieties, our local weather, climate change, not to mention gardeners like you and me growing non-native plants and possibly growing crops out of season. It's definitely something to think about next time you harvest that delicious summer fruit. Know what else is delicious to think about? Quite likely the next episode of the Garden Quickie. The deep dark winter shuts a lot of us growers down. Some more than others. And some less. But regardless of where you live and how bad your winter is, I can guarantee you there's still stuff you can do. And we want stuff to do. As much fun as the winter break is and how necessary it can be for our gardens to thrive, our green thumbs need work. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms and welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we cover all your gardening questions. And today is all about winter gardening tasks. I've compiled my top 10, time short, so let's get into it. Task number one is to clean and sharpen your tools. Now is the time to care for the hardware. You have the time and it lengthens their life while keeping them out of the landfill. Two, organizing and dealing with old plants and pots. That means composting the old potted plants and the soil that remains in them. Or setting the soil aside for reclamation. Check this video here on how you can do that. Three, order your seeds. Growing your own garden at home is simply booming right now. And the last two winters have had massive seed shortages at the retail level. Get yours early or maybe not at all. Four, chop and drop old crops to protect the soil in your raised beds. And if there's still bare soil left over, mulch with straw or grass clippings to protect that top layer during the harshest months of the year. Six, take cuttings from shrubs and berry bushes and get them started early indoors. Now is the perfect time. If need be, repair infrastructure like broken raised beds, gates, or other such things that need your attention. And if you're lucky enough to be in the market to expand your garden, build new raised beds now, or get the land ready for some new plots. For the super keen growers, seed starting is not far away. So ensure that trays and pots are sterilized and that you have your seeding soil mixes ready to go. And lastly, it never hurts to plan. The best gardens are the ones that are well thought out ahead of time, giving each crop the exact window of opportunity it needs to thrive and produce. Know what else is gonna help your plants thrive and produce? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Growing your own garden is always exciting. And if this year's your first time trying, your enthusiasm is probably off the charts. For veteran growers, deciding what to grow in the new year is like being a kid in a candy store. But for new gardeners, it can be an unnecessary stress. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we give you all the best gardening tips. And today, it's all about my top five list of veggies to grow this year. I picked these crops for new growers based on two criteria, ease of growth and a high level of bounty. Time short, so let's dive in. First up are peas. Snow, English, and sugar snap are the types available. Cold tolerant to a degree, peas are highly prolific. And even though they are a flowering plant, which normally involves more resources and time than say a leafy crop, peas grow so fast, it negates this disadvantage. Next, we have lettuce. So many varieties to choose from and very hardy to all but the coldest and hottest days of the year. Grown just for the foliage, lettuce can be harvested again and again, making it one of your most rewarding crops. At number three, we have another flowering plant, the most popular squash variety, and that's zucchinis. Once again, a more involved crop 
than just your leafy ones. However, while peas make up for this with speed, zucchinis make up for this with bounty, one of the most prolific plants you'll ever grow. Next up are herbs, specifically the lush, fast-growing ones like arugula, basil, cilantro, and dill. Grown outside or in, multi-harvest these wonders of flavor all year long. If you're just starting out, herbs are definitely a go-to crop. Lastly, we have a beast of a leafy green, and that's kale. Robust, long-lived, hardy, and undemanding. Kale is a wonder plant, both in nutrition and in harvest. Snow, rain, freezing, nothing stops these guys. Multi-harvest them all year long, as kale is the plant that keeps on giving. Know what else keeps on giving? Garden quickies. I'll see you in the next one. The new year has started, and with that, new plans and ideas for your garden. The itch to get growing is never higher than in the two months prior to spring. For gardeners in cold climates, the yearly ritual of starting summer crops early indoors is both welcomed and anticipated. But there's a fine line between enthusiasm and planning with the proper patience. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show in two minutes or less, we help out your garden in ways you didn't even think possible. And today is all about practicing patience. After a month or more of bitter, cold, dreary weather, we're done with it. Bring on the planting. But hold on. Planting too early, both for direct seeding and for transplants, can have consequences. Let me explain. Planting seeds too early in the year can often lead to poor results. For some seeds like peas, it's fine. They'll just lie dormant, waiting for the right conditions. Others, like corn, well, they'll simply rot and not germinate at all. And in the middle, we have plants like carrots, where the rate of germination may be lessened, giving you slightly spotty rows. You gotta wait. For starter plants, bringing them out too early in the year can lead to severe transplant shock, foliar necrosis, root damage, and overall stunted growth. But what about our favorite summertime crops that we start early indoors every year, like tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers? Well, even those guys can be started too early, with the plants becoming too large, lush, leggy, and possibly root-bound. The general timeline for warm weather crops is to be pre-seeded indoors about six to eight weeks before your last spring frost. So for many of us, we still have a ways to go. If you're like me and you just can't wait, keep those green thumbs busy, check out my top 10 list of winter gardening tasks. Don't fret, spring is on its way. Know what else is on its way? Hopefully the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Brassicas. 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 In terms of food crops, one of the most important groups of plants we grow. The ones we're concerned with as gardeners, the broccolis, the cauliflowers, and the kales, are all actually variants of the same species. Brassica oleracea. This genus of plants, commonly called cabbages, are an absolute staple in temperate gardens. And they're super easy to grow, provided you get one thing right. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we answer the most asked gardening questions. And today is all about brassica timing. When do we plant these guys? Cabbages and their cohorts taste best when they're harvested in cooler weather, but that doesn't mean that's when you plant them. Some leafy varieties are tolerant of really cool weather, such as kale and collards, but for the most part, harvesting just above freezing is ideal. Which is why timing is so important to brassicas. In temperate regions like mine, we have two ideal times to harvest, spring and fall. Fall is easiest to grow for because we have the warm weather to enjoy to get these guys started. But as brassicas are almost never direct seeded, a spring harvest is entirely possible as well. From the time of sprouting, most brassicas, even the large fruiting kinds, are a 50 to 70 day crop. At 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, germination takes roughly five to 10 days. So now we have a known window of growing time. Great. So for a fall harvest, start your seeds roughly 60 days or two months before your first fall frost. And for a spring harvest, Start your seeds indoors about a month before your last spring frost date. These dates will time a cool harvest perfectly and avoid the freezing or damaging weather. 
For warm climates, you can be a little more fluid. The easiest is to start your seeds in the hottest month of the year. So if you're in Southern California, start your seeds in August to enjoy that November harvest. Know what else you can enjoy? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Compost is an absolute wonder product of our backyard garden. A completely natural component of the backyard cycle that can elevate an average crop to an unreal one. Just the act of composting all your kitchen scraps can keep as much as 30% of all household waste out of the trash. And as we know, there's a massive sink of nutrients that becomes available within our compost as that organic matter breaks down. But even with those two things aside, there's still more reasons to love compost in our gardens. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we take a deep dive on the most talked about gardening topics. And today is all about those extra lesser known benefits of compost. Compost reduces our waste footprint and it's full of nutrients that we can add to our garden. Well, hold on to your hats, because it gets even better. Compost has many additional benefits, but here's three big ones that all gardeners should take note of. Organic matters. Soil is made up of five things. Air, water, minerals, organic matter, and living organisms. Compost has all of these things, but it's really high in the ladder. And it's these two things that give compost its big beneficial boost. The addition of compost improves your soil in every way, but one big improvement is seen in moisture retention. By improving the soil structure itself, the addition of organic matter increases the soil's ability to grab moisture, hold on to it, and make it available to your plants. At the other end of the spectrum is aeration. Just as water is vital to the health of our crops, so is air, specifically oxygen. Because your soil structure is greatly improved with the addition of compost, so is the amount and consistency of air gaps. Compaction is mitigated and your soil can function and live up to its full potential. And finally, compost adds life. Your compost is teeming with life at the micro level and adding it to your garden is an inoculation like no other. You see, compost is full of beneficial microbes and bacteria that are necessary for the main nutrient cycles in our garden. By adding these back to our soil in even just moderate quantities, the boost leads to an unmatched injection of bioactivity, allowing your soil to support even greater crops. You know what else is going to support greater crops? Quite likely the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Right now in the gardening world, it's the equivalent of crazy time. Everyone's going seed silly at this point, and this year's no different. While we've already touched on resisting the urge and not pre-starting our seeds indoors too early, even though we really, really want to, the one question I see a lot of right now is what's better, direct seeding or starter plants? When you're in the middle of planning out your garden for the year, anticipating those epic harvests that we work so hard for, it only makes sense that you want to do it right. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie. Number 40, in fact. It's the show where we answer the most relevant gardening questions of the day. And today is all about direct seeding versus starter plants. What to choose? What are the advantages to each method? And what about any disadvantages? As always, time's ticking, so let's dive in. Right off the bat, some crops only make sense to direct seed. Garden favorites such as carrots and beets and radishes and even spinach. It doesn't make sense to take thousands of individuals of those plants, pre-start them elsewhere, and try to get them into the garden. That would be a logistical nightmare. But then on the flip side, we have heavy hitters like peppers, tomatoes, zucchinis, and cucumbers that really lend themselves to getting started in individual containers and then planted outside when the spring hits. To further complicate and confuse us, we also have plants in the middle. Things like peas and beans and even corn. Fast growing plants that don't need a head start, but you still can if you want to. So what to choose? Well, I'll leave you with this. 
here's my go-to list of advantages and disadvantages for both direct seeding and transplants. Hopefully the pros and cons of my list here will get you started in deciding what's best for your garden this year. And then to hammer it home, here's my big list of my top crops that I grow and how I choose to grow them. Between these two lists, you'll have a good idea of what crops are to be direct seeded and what crops are better off transplanted. Know what else is a good idea? Quite likely the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.